<laughs> good morning to some folks. Good afternoon to other folks. I'm Trudy Murata. I'm a volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. And from our earliest beginnings, AARP has championed lifelong learning. That's why AARP is thrilled to be collaborating with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia to bring our members just a sampling of the rich programs offered by them each semester. So at the end of this program, if you have just a few extra minutes, I would encourage you to go to their website, which is lli.nova.org, and I'll put that in the chat for you as well, just to see all of the um, slate of classes and curriculums and tours and other activities that LLI Nova has available. So with that, I'll turn the program back over to our at Lifetime Learning Institute. Deb, go ahead. I can't hear you. Cannot hear you. I'm, okay, I'm Debbie Cohen, treasurer of Lifetime Learning Institute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, of Northern Virginia, and I'd like to welcome our AARP registrants along with our LLI Nova members. We are a member-run organization and we're affiliated with the Annandale campus of NOVA that offers educational and cultural pursuits to adults 50 and over. For a modest annual fee, we provide members with more than 100 virtual and in-person classes year-round, uh, as well as informal special interest groups, monthly speaker forums, social events, and the opportunity for new friendships. Members can also access discounted visual and performing arts tickets, as well as regional day and overnight trips and US and overseas study travel. In fact, we have a planned trip to Ireland on May 14th to 28th, and you can read about that on our website. We have three other virtual opportunities this winter. On February 1st, we have a monthly forum focusing on four paws for ability an organization to train service dogs to help people with a variety of disabilities. On February 28th, we have a class revisiting favorites and exploring new relationships in art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Renwick. And then on March 1st, we, have, uh, we are featuring the humorous Arch Campbell, um, which who many of you may remember. Um, he, was a nationally known entertainment reporter and he was a fixture on NBC4 for many, many years. And now I'll turn it over to Phil Santini. Can't hear you. Said now I'll turn it over to Phil. It keeps muting. Okay, can you hear me now, Barry? Yes. Okay, great, great. Anyway, welcome everybody. So glad for your interest and your attendance today. Barry has a PhD, he has a PhD in geology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he's done myriad science and geology classes for our LLI group for many years. Today, he's turning his focus to his personal journey with Parkinson's disease. I will monitor the chat. I will interrupt as appropriate, but there will be time at the end for questions. With that, I turn it over to Barry. Okay, as we were talking a little before we started with John, who also has Parkinson's, and he was told by his wife that we have Parkinson's. Well, believe me, Bill and I have Parkinson's. She's my tremendous support. But anyway, uh, I think actually I've given 40 talks. I looked, I looked it up the other day on geology and geology related things. All my degrees, my master's in geological engineering, undergraduate in geology. And other than some distance learning and computer stuff, that's pretty much my whole life. And the important thing to remember is the only time that I took a true biology course was in 1952, 1952. I'm 85 years old, so that's quite a while ago. So. It's been a learning experience to say the least as I've gone through the putting together the presentation and putting up with it. I'm diagnosed about 2015. And so 
I'm getting pretty smart about it. This particular uh, screen right here is what, what I put together, or we put together, since we're organizing the Parkinson support group, we find that, that like alcoholism, which I know a little bit about too, uh, you, you share things and it helps tremendously. So anyway, so I'm going to tell you, and if I make any mistakes, I'm surely open to any appreciation. And if you have questions during the chat or during the talk, please put them in the chat and fill the side if, if it's so incomplete what I'm talking about that I'll stop and interrupt it. Okay, one of the key things, uh, you can't see it all, but Parkinson's at first was called shaking palsy. Palsy was actually an old word for paralysis. That's so not quite what it means today, but that's exactly what it was. The key is that it, even though you can't really see it, this date here is 1817. So we've known, <clears throat> of course it was named after him. He called it, Parkinson's disease. It was a neurogenerative disease. So neuro meaning uh, mis things that carry information back and forth. And it's been studied. It's been examined hundreds of thousands of times, probably in the 206 years or whatever it is since that, 216. And they still are not really too clear about how to identify it how to stop it, how to slow it down. We have ways, we have methods, but it seems like I get the feeling everybody that's involved with Parkinson's is a guinea pig unto themselves and unto the system. Now, <laughs> this came up because there's been an ad on television for something that they describe as PD that has to do with crooked carrots. But anyway, whenever I say PD, I'm talking about Parkinson's disease. What I wanna talk about today, what I'm gonna do is why am I here? Well, I'm here because I have Parkinson's and I feel that I like to share what I've learned and it was a driving force to get me to get a lot more background. And what happens in my process of just getting ready for this was I began to realize how many years before I actually started the tremors that I had symptoms that are very unique to Parkinson's. And I'm not gonna, I'll talk about a couple of them, but uh, I look back and I say, oh, my, I thought this was that or whatever. No, now, as I mentioned before, I think I, I get this clear. I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I got 45 years sobriety. I got so sober July of 1978 thanks to the woman over here. Anyway, so that whether that's a factor or not, I don't know. It's been the last, well, as I said, about uh, January of 2015, my wife noticed that my thumb was spinning and that was the start of the whole trip to where I am today. Where do I get my information? I get a lot off the web, but I'm very careful about that. I get it wherever I can. I get it from other patients. We have a boxing group that meets once a week for an hour and a half. I get it from people there. What is Parkinsonism? And I'll talk about that. So actually, when I look at my, when I went to the doctor this morning, today, I just happened to be the day that I see my neurologist once every three to four months. And I noticed on the, on the what, what's wrong is it's Parkinsonism which covers a lot of things besides just Parkinson's and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And then what is Parkinson's disease? It's just a subset of Parkinsonism. There are other ones that will come to. A journey so far, green sink, string support, and then future hopes. Okay, did anybody remember this guy? Emo Phillips, it's a famous comedian or a popular comedian back in the 60s. <clears throat> and I like to bring him up because I love this quote. I used to think that the brain was the most wonderful organ in my body. And I realized who was telling me this. And that's the whole point about Parkinson's. It's a brain disease. So you're thinking all the time about your brain disease 
with the diseased brain. It's a, not in fact virus or bacteria. There was a while there that they had encephalitis as one of the causes for Parkinson's. That has to do with, we'll talk about that in a minute. It has to do with the movie Awakenings, if you remember that, where DOPA solved the problem for a little while, but in, in fact, they actually did have Parkinson's. The irony is I'll be describing my brain malfunctions using a partially malfunctioning brain. So that's the other reason that I'm kind of driven into this. So far, I haven't seen much cognitive affection, infection or any, a cognitive disability. In fact, I, I've been writing play or uh, uh, poems at a rapid rate, passing them out to friends. And it's kind of amazing. I don't know where that whole thing came from. Anyway, where do I get my information? Parkinson's Foundation. My neurologist is Dr. Nicole Dietz. She's with the Neurology Group of Virginia. Fellow green screen patients, some Google, but more Google Scholar. I don't know how many of you out there are familiar with Google Scholar, but it's my favorite go-to thing when it comes to anything. It's as if you're doing a dissertation and you try to use secondary references, that would be Google, but you can't, you have to use primary references. Here, here's where you'd go. I'll give a couple of examples of that. Here's, here's a search I did on Parkinson's and stem cell. What impresses me, but not my wife for some reason, is the fact that I got 25 million hits. Think about it, 25,600,000 results in 0.5 seconds. And these are some of them, but notice this. How does Google make its money? It, pref it, it gives preferential treatment, to people who give it money. So if I Googled this and I said, well, here's probably the best answer is the Anderson Clinic, and it may be, I'm still in a little trouble. Let me move this out of the way. I don't know how to get rid of this. How do I get rid of this thing? Anyway, this is what happens when you type Google Scholar, this exact same query, and you get 27, 237,000 hits, but every one of them from an academic institution, every one or most of them at least, probably good for, okay. Then I get myself in trouble sometimes because I'll do something on Alzheimer's, for instance, because it's related. It comes down to the same room, it's not the same cause, but it's related. And then I get a bit over my head. I get something like this. Reserve it's all mediated regulation of hippocampal neurodegeneration. <laughs> I just turn it over. Say that three times. Can you see somebody in a bar and somebody says, what did you do for your dissertation? I did reserve anyway. So uh, my limits are my limits as a scientist, but my limits as sticking mostly my dissertation in my area of study was geophysics and geochemistry. So biology has not been one of my strong strengths. I have a series of connections here that I think are somewhat important. It's Parkinsonism, an umbrella term that refers to brain conditions that cause slow movement, rigidity, and tremors. We'll find out rigidity is called bradykinesis. And these conditions can happen, but most of the time, we're talking about something not there. And what's not there is the means of transportation of, of information from one place to another. If I stick my toe in a very hot bathtub, immediately the signals go out up to the brain saying, whoa, do something about that. The brain says, I know what to do, pull the toe out, whoa, down it goes. That's passed on, of course. It's not pure electricity, it's neurons, it's cells passing the information on. And what happens with me and people like me is that some of those neurons have been de have degenerated and they're not act actually doing it. So when, when I, it's almost like telling your foot to move, coming with age. I'll talk a lot about the fact that I'm 85 and I don't know how that plays into this. But one of the things, when I was a kid and I gave a command to my knees to do something in tennis, 
it was an instant thing. It takes a lot longer for it to get there now. So I'm not as agile as I used to be. CBD, not referring to uh, cannabis in any way, is cortical basal ganglia denaturation, denaturation. And I'm not going to go into great detail about all these by, by any means, but what it is is the degeneration of nerve cells in the brain, which causes the Parkinsonism. It's a progressive neurological disorder characterized by cell loss and atrophy, shrinkage of the cells. Then we can have progressive supranuclear paralysis. Again, palsy paralysis, pretty much the same. PSP, I think we know somebody who has PSP. It's again, under the umbrella of Parkinsonisms. It is not Parkinson's, but it has many of the similar things. It's an uncommon brain disorder. And it's also called the Steele Richardson Olsen-Losey syndrome. Then we have depression, which can occur, of course, because when you're told you have Parkinson's, and I'm afraid I know very little about Parkinson's. When I have none, as far as I know, I have no family history. I had no friends that had Parkinson's. So it's kind of new to me. In fact, Michael J. Fox was one of the big eye openers. And uh, then we met a woman at the gym who we've followed through the stages and that brought it home to me, but I really didn't know that much. So it's understandable how you would get depressed from it. This is interesting to me. Parkinson's syndrome after encephalitis. Again, if you remember the movie Wait, Awakenings, it's the story of Oliver Sacks, played by De Niro, and how he had these all these patients in this hospital in a coma. They wouldn't come out of the coma. And he gave them L-DOPA, the same pills I take every day. I take eight dopa, uh, carbidopa, levodopa. I'll talk about that in more detail. But it brought them out of the coma. And every and if you walk out of the movie, you say, was it that wonderful? What they didn't tell you is what it did was just awaken their Parkinsonism and they went through the same stages everybody does. But anyway, one that's not on here that's interesting is called drug-induced Parkinson's. And there are certain drugs that you can take that seem to want to kill the uh, dopamine. We'll get to dopamine in a minute. It's the main carrier, neurogenerator, neurotransmitter, and it killed the the uh, Dopamine, Huntington disease, another one, multi-system atrophy, MSA. These are all Parkinisms. So what they do is they mean they have movement and non-movement, motor and non-motor sig significant uh, symptoms. Basal, oops, Wilson's disease, I love this with heptonuclear. People. So here we call this it is Bearson, and he, he is, it he is either case he's speaking is. now, but well, this is. But now, what? Oops. Now we see exactly what we're talking about. Parkinson's disease is in the center. It has its own unique set of criteria, its own set of symptoms, an essential tremor. And I think everybody who's ever started with any kind of a tremor. We're hoping that they had essential tremor because it doesn't seem as bad as Parkinson's. There's a distinct, distinct uh, just difference between them, but it's not as simple as I was first told. I remember going to a lecture, one of the forums that we had at LLI, and basically the woman said, oh, it's very simple. If while you're holding something, it shakes, which I do uh, now, I did in the beginning. I remember I started with my thumb doing this. Now I'm at a stage seven years later where I have a little trouble holding something steady. If it's something you're holding, it's it's a, it's essential tremor. If it happens at rest, it's Parkinson's. Well, it's not that simple by any means, and I'll go into a little more detail on that. But again, let me just come back to the fact that this whole group of things all have the same issue, pretty much the same cause, in, in the sense that it's taking away the important thing, either dopamine or dopamine-like substances that are transmitters and not allowing your brain to communicate with whatever it wants to communicate with. 
Can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Can everybody, can you make your volume louder? Because people are complaining that it's too soft. How do I do that? I'll be right there. Well, I can do it above. Um, Barry, sometimes just leaning in closer to your computer, yeah, okay. the volume. No, you can't get it. You have to go out. Oh. oh. Yeah, in most cases, what you'll just have to get closer to the mic, Barry. Okay, closer. Closer. okay. okay. And, uh, is that, is that any better? Place, if, you're, if you're having trouble hearing, the other thing you may do be able to do is turn the volume on your own computer up. But he can't get to it now, and it's not his computer; it's my. No, computer. no, it's uh, no, it's not Barry's end. It'd be the other end if if people turn up the volume. Oh, right. on they their can turn computer. up their own. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, he doesn't really have any control over his mic other than just getting closer to it. Okay, can, is that any better? Yeah, that's better, Barry. You're right in the screen. <laughs> yeah. Parkinson's PD occurs when brain cells that make dopamine, a chemical that coordinates movement, stop working or die. The part that I don't understand, and I'm, as again, I keep apologizing for my lack of biology, is why we can't tell how much dopamine is in our system. The only way I found out that I was lacking dopamine was by taking a pill that had dopamine in it and it improved my symptoms. That's kind of a backwards, considering we've talked about this disease for 217 years, that I still don't know a way of measuring your dopamine level. All they know is the symptoms that you show indicate you don't have enough dopamine. As far as I know, unless somebody can correct me, there's no such thing as you can tell if your sugar level is too low, if you have diabetes. You can tell if your iron level is too low, your sodium level, everything else. Now, I know this is not the same as a mineral or anything like that, but it's still, we don't know. It's called a movement disorder. That's because it's best known for its movements, but it's been, as I said, an eye opener for me to realize there are a lot of non-movement things that have been going on in my life that probably could be attached to Parkinson's. Now I got to watch it that I back up and say, oh, that was all Parkinson. That is not the reason I became an alcoholic. I became an alcoholic because I'm stupid or was stupid at the time. I got a lot smarter afterward. Anyway, they're non-movement symptoms. These are the ones I'm talking about. A, a very simple example is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. In fact, they were trying to make a connection between IBS and the cause of Parkinson's. So not only do we not know exactly how to tell you have Parkinson's other than the symptoms, we certainly have nothing to treat it immediately other than give you more levodopa carbidopa. It's a lifelong and progressive disease. And there's the key word right here. We have phases, but the trouble is we don't have phases like you do in many other diseases where you can measure something. We have a friend, and I remember how shocked I was when she told me, told us that she had stage four, some kind of cancer. I won't even mention it, doesn't matter. But as soon as you hear the word stage four, you go into it. There are no stages for Parkinson's. There are phases, there are expectations of your behavior, but there are no stages, even though it does go through predictable things. The other thing is it's unique to each person. I have nine other people that I meet once a week for an hour and a half to do boxing. We don't hit each other, but we almost do. And every one of them is at a different stage and a different person, has different problems. One of them, one, one of our friends has Parkinson's and he hasn't been able to smell or taste things for years, never understood why. That's one of the non-movement symptoms. So they, So you cannot predict which symptom you will get Okay, I was told almost from the beginning by Dr. Uh, Dietz that I probably had the better of the choices that I could have. I had no writhing, dys dyskinesis. I had no none of the other things, and it it was it was going to it was going to continue to change, and as it does. Uh, but one of the other, okay, when you will get them? Okay, again, I don't know what. One of the symptoms that I've gotten that we're worried about a little more now 
is lightheadedness when I stand up. If I've been sitting for any period of time and I go to stand up, all of a sudden I'm dizzy. If I wait a minute or two, it's fine. It all has to do with my blood pressure. And I was talking to some of you earlier. It's really ironic that I spent most of my life, most of my adult life fighting hypertension. I had too much. My blood pressure would, when I went into one particular hospital, it was 200 over 150. I mean, it's, it's been outrageously high. And I did everything I could. So I take three pills at least to bring it down. Well, now it's too low. When they took it at the doctor today, it was 140 over 69. So now I'm going to have to start doing something, <laughs> ironically, to correct that. She's telling me, eat more salt. Eat more salt? I've spent my whole life trying to avoid salt. She's suggesting I wear a belt around my stomach to keep the blood from going down too fast. I mean, you never know what's coming and when, when they're going to happen. But I just go along with her judgment. It affects nearly a million people in the United States. Get this darn thing up. We'll put it up here. Again. Do you see that? Am I moving something? And six million people worldwide. Yeah, we can see your pointer, Barry. No, but you can't see this black. Yeah, we see the black. It looks yeah, okay. like a mouse. We know what we know yeah. what mechanisms produce the symptoms. We do not know why. Okay, so again, symptom do, do, do dominated. Let me pull this down again. The most prominent symptoms when the cells in the basal ganglia. Now there we go. I had to go back to my uh, my biology of 1952. The basal ganglia is the bottom of your brain that really controls a lot of things. It's the, it's the transmission station for lots and lots of stuff. And usually nerve cells or neurons, because they call it neurodegenerative disease, neuro produce an important brain chemical called dopamine. Nobody knows what causes the neurons to die. If they knew that, they'd be on, on to a cure. And again, I'm talking about when I went into Google Scholar and looked at some of the sites that had 26,000 hits, probably 25,000 and then there were legitimate papers on searches and studies that are going on. So it's not like this has been ignored. It's just that nobody seems to come up with the magic bullet. And of course, cancer and other diseases are kind of in the same situation. Nor norepinephrine Norepinephrine, the main chemical messenger for the nervous system, and, and see it controls the blood pressure. So if I lose norepinephrine, then I lose blood pressure. If I lose blood pressure, when I stand up, all of a sudden there's no brain, all, all the all the blood is left out left out of my brain, and I'm kind of dizzy. It took me a while to catch on to that, to stand there for a minute or two before I take any steps. Because one of the things besides all this is, is falls. And that's the one thing I'm trying to avoid. The loss of this might explain some of the non-movement features such as fatigue, irregular blood pressure, food through the digestive, that's called irritable bowel syndrome, and sudden drop in blood pressure when a person stands up. A different thing, but related to the Parkinsonian thing, is Lewy bodies, which are clumps of, of, of proteins that called alpha synuclein that add to dementia. Lewy body dementia, darn this thing. Scientists are trying to alpha synuclein it and its relationship to Lewy body dementia. So again, there's two, in a way, one way you can look at it, there's two outings from, from all these particular problems that we have. One possibility is dementia. I think, I'd like to think, and I'll do a little poem for you a little later that I wrote that I'm very proud of, that I've kind of avoided that. But I'm going with all the motor, non-motor. 
Here you go, Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Is it related? One of the things they would assume, like most diseases, the more we learn about genetics, the more we wanna say that's probably what it is. As I said, I have no history whatsoever of Parkinson's. Never heard of the disease. I guess I did, but it never meant anything to me. Never knew anybody who had it. And certainly nobody in my immediate mother and father family way on back. So there's, there's some genetic risk. Parkinson's disease produces dopamine and the dopamine producing cells are just not working. We talk about the basic, this is the main transmission station for everything. And it sends out the, the neurons or the cells, the transmitter cells. I look, kind of look at it like almost like a Wi-Fi system. And you, you're sending out packets of information. And sometimes your packets are missing. John and I have missing packets every now and then. If you don't mind me re referring to that, John. Some cases of, of PD again, nothing to do with carrots, appear to be hereditary and some can be genetic, but probably 10 to 15% of all Parkinson's, only through the study of, of, of genealogy probably did they come to that conclusion. In some families, they're inherited, but does not seem to run in families. There's, and no specific gene has been identified. That's the key. Once you get something that's genetically inherited, your, your only goal is to find out which gene it is that's passing on. So they keep talking about exposure to toxins. It seems to me that's an easy out. I mean, everybody gets, everybody knows that toxins are gonna to cause some problems. Whether they call those, I mean, it's it just, they don't give any, at least the reading that I did, that I'm, again, no expert by any means, just looking after myself and my wife. But anybody who's been exposed or read anything knows the exposure to toxins is top of the list. What are the stages, okay? I'm gonna give you a, one set of stage that I don't like to go over, and I have another, another one here. Uh, I'll read you something from it, but anyway. The stages in 1967 were put together by two researchers and created the stages of stage one, mild tremors and mild difficulty walking. It affects one side of the body, my right side. Loved ones may also notice, I don't notice it, but Phil keeps telling me. I, in fact, what, what I do know, what I do know is that people will stop me and say, is there something wrong? And I feel the same as I felt ever. Some days I'm really happy, but I don't look happy. And I, it didn't dawn on me that it was affecting people like that. Stage two, the symptoms worse. Tremors and difficulty moving now affect both sides. So that's where I'm at, at least as far as I can tell. I'm in stage two because both my left and my right hand I'm left-handed, but I, for some reason, was forced to eat with my right hand. So I eat with my right hand, but I have special uh, utility, uh, special utensils that only allow, that are very heavy. And I use them kind of simply because otherwise, especially if I'm trying to drink a glass of, or eat, drink a cup of coffee, very hot coffee, that's a little down. So they're difficult, but not impossible. Stage three, coordination is now affected. I'm beginning to get there. I've fallen several times. And uh, that's the biggest worry of all because uh, I'm gonna say this now and I'll say it again. People do not die of Parkinson's. People die with Parkinson's. Okay, Parkinson's causes some other in instance, some other thing like a fall or choking or something else that finally stops you. But Parkinson itself is not a terminal disease. Four becomes challenging, difficult to leave because... Now in my boxing class of the 10, there's some people that are at stage four and still doing boxing. They sit in the chair and hit the bag instead of standing like I do and hitting. So you can see all stages when you're 
have people around. And again, as far as I can tell, there's no guarantee that everybody is going to go through every one of these stages. Okay. In stage five, difficult standing, we have several people around here who have the electric EMV vehicles. And in a couple of cases, they have the dyskinesis and the bradykinesis. This bradykinesis is slowness of walking. Dyskinesis is when you're doing the thing that brought, you, that brought uh, Michael Fox to everybody's attention. When you're doing things like writhing and, and you can't help yourself. That's stage five. I have here another set. It's called the M, the MDS, the multiple, the, the Movement Disorder Societies, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rule Rating Scale. And here's one that I find kind of not interesting, but features of dopamine dysregulation syndrome, instructions to caregiver. Over the past week, have you had unusually strong urges that are hard to control? Do you feel driven to do or think about something and find it hard to stop? Zero is normal. One is slight. People are present, but don't cause any difficulties. Two is mild. Problems are present and cause a few difficulties. Three is moderate. Problems are present and cause a lot of difficulties. And four is severe. And problems are present and preclude the patient's ability to kill out carry out normal activities. So there's a whole set of conditions that are spelled out that tells you which phase, which stage. But again, it is not the same as stage four cancer or stage three cancer. They're all based on chemical analysis, biological analysis. This is based strictly on your behavior. I'm not saying you've been a bad person, but whatever it is, it's, 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 it's the hell all of everything. So I'll give you some of the symptoms and don't try to find them in your, your history. There isn't a the, the test. So the first thing I did when I went to see my doctor was play this game of touch your nose and do, to do, to do, to do, move your fingers. And I passed everything fine. And the only symptom that I had at the time was a twisting little thumb. So there's not a lot you could do. You can do a little, there is a test called a, a, a DAT, capital D, little a, T, capital T, which is a sort of electronic test. It's like an MRI of sorts, but apparently it isn't very good. Most of the time, what they do is they go by these particular symptoms. For motor issues, it's tremors, 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 or tremor, whether you have one or many. Okay. Now, again, this could be confused with essential tremors, which is not Parkinson's. Rigidity. I don't seem to have that problem. But then again, my best estimate at all these things is by asking my honest wife who will tell me, yes, you do. I don't notice them, of course. I'm not watching myself walk down the street. But rigidity, bradykinesia, which is slowness of walking and, and slowed everything down. You shuffle. You ever seen anybody shuffling? Chances are they're, they have some sort of neurological disorder. There's something called big which is part of some, the whole thing is LSVT, which is Lee Solomon vocal train. I don't know how that got the name for everything, but there's a woman named Lee Solomon, Sullivan, who started uh, different ways of working with people. I took big twice with the occupational therapy, physical therapy people here. Physical at therapy. The and what is it, a series of, 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 of ten exercises. Different exercises where you use your feet, you use your butt, and you're constantly, the important thing that it comes with loud, because anytime we do boxing, anytime we do big, they say, speak out, louder, louder, because one of the things that happens to people is they have a tendency to not talk very loud. So that's one of the postural instability, yeah, you fall, vocal symptoms, again, we have a good friend who's very active in this in this group here, and he has a very hard to hear sometimes. There's a system called Loud put out by the same woman, the same organization that talks about big. And I used to go to a meeting when I was first diagnosed with this, where we basically sat in a big circle and screamed at each other. 
but it's 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 appropriate. And again, most of the time you don't realize what you're what you're doing. You need you need outside influence. You need somebody who knows you to tell you exactly what's going on. You have writing changes, walking or gait difficulties. Now, in the non-motor, they're, they're the ones that are a little harder to recognize, as far as I'm concerned. Depression and anxiety. Now, you got to be depressed if you're told you all of a sudden that you have this disease that's going to progress and then you still have years to go. I hate to say it, but it's almost better to get it at 85 than to get it at 25. So anyway, you, you're, you're still left with anxiety and so on. So if you, if you need pills for that, do it. Disturbances in the sense of smell. I haven't had that. Uh, some of the people, again, I told you, that was the first uh, symptom that they had. Fatigue is hard. Again, I'll, I'll come back to this over and over again. But a lot of these things, to me, are hard to tease out what is 85 and what is Parkinson's. I mean, 85-year-old people get tired, OK? I do a lot of exercise, but I still get tired. Is that my Parkinson's tiredness or is that an old fart tiredness? IBS, very important. I've had that all my life, just about all my adult life, I've had problems with having bowel movements. And that is one of the things, and I'll talk about a little bit later about the connection that there may be, there's some thought. In fact, I brought it up to my neurologist this morning and she didn't dismiss it that maybe some of the Parkinson is caused by IBS, not a symptom of IBS. Lightheadedness I talked about, and this one's really important because this is another one that I had that I didn't realize I had. And that is Stop, 10 years ago, I, well, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden I had this crazy dream that somebody was chasing me and I went roaring off the side of the bed and hit my head on a, on a, on a desk by, by the room and caused a little damage, a little blood and everything. And what it was, was REM, rapid eye movement, sleep disorders. I didn't realize, but when you go into REM sleep, true REM sleep, the reason it's so affecting is because you're paralyzed. Your brain quits sending out signals and there's no way you can move. When you have dopamine deficiency, when you have Parkinson's, some of that paralysis doesn't take place. So every night before I go to bed, I take a pill called clonazepam, along with a couple melatonin, and that helps me get through the night. I haven't had any sleep disorders since, and that's that's very important. So some people tell me they get up in the middle of the night, and then they never go back to bed. That's insomnia. They're not necessarily related, but if if, if the the point with most REM sleep disorder issues and, and, and examples, people have hallucinatory kind of things, really wild dreams, which led, lead them to do wild things. And again, at least some of these symptoms can be assigned to the aging. It's difficult to tease out what is due to being 85 plus, turned 85 last November, and what is Parkinson's. There are four primary motor symptoms, tremor, rigidity, radiokinesis, slow movement, shuffling, and instability balance problems. Two or more of these is what generally says you have Parkinson's. Not all these must be present. Phil and I will be walking in the hall around here and we'll see somebody and we go, probably Parkinson's. Now that's unfair. There are many neurological disorders, but it seems to be Never stop to ask them if they've been identified or they're part of that. But I know I don't see them at support meetings, so maybe I can't do that. But anyway, that's the rule anyway. And it's important that not everybody with PD has a tumor, tremor, okay? You can have many of those other non-motor symptoms and not have a tremor. In fact, my doctor told me I was lucky that I had the tremor because that led down a path that was a little different. It's, and it's just the opposite of that. It, just because you have a tremor doesn't mean you have Parkinson's. You could have essential tremors. You could have let, many of other things that cause tremors. We all have tremors when we're frightened. 
you know, the whole body is, is ready for that. Essential tremor disorder. Okay, that's the thing. It causes rhythmic shaking that most often affects the hands, but also the head, the voice, the arms, or the legs. And you've seen people, and generally they're older people, who just shake. I mean, that was just kind of what happened. We had a teacher once. This is really sad. I never even mentioned this to my wife. I had a teacher in, in junior high school that we called Shaky Jake because he just shook all the time. He was a nice teacher. He was a great teacher, and his name was Jake, and he had either central tremors or Parkinson's, but we didn't know that at the time. So if you have essential tremors, you, you, there are things, to, if you have none of the other characteristics of Parkinson's, then that's it. It's not related to Parkinson's disease. It has nothing to do with dopamine deficiency. Again, when you have sugar deficiencies, when you have insulin deficiencies, we call it diabetes. When you have dopamine deficiencies, we call it many Parkinsonianisms. If you have specific dopamine deficiencies, we call it Parkinson's. Shaking occurs, tight shoelaces, writing, shaving. I don't have any of those issues. And symptoms may be exact, aggravated by stress, caffeine, and temperature extreme. PD motor symptoms. And I'm giving you an example of those that I've experienced. Tremors, started with my right thumb. Okay. Rigidity. I don't seem to have that, but I, I might, but I don't notice it. Mask-like expression of the face, my wife tells me I do. I can't tell it, I have no idea I'm looking that. But too many times lately people tell me, well, is something wrong, what's going on anyway? The break rate of the eyes, motor coordinations, trouble buttoning a shirt. There's an instrument that I use now like this, where you put this, the button in here and you pull it through the, sh the, the, the hole and it buttons the shirt for you. Because the fine motor skills are one of the first things to go. Trouble turning over in bed. When I'm on my back, I'm on my back. Almost need a crane to get me back over to the other side. Small handwriting doesn't seem to be an issue, but I'm almost always on the computer. And I really haven't, I was always a terrible typist, so I couldn't tell the difference whether it's good or bad. Can't stay and prevent a fall. That's the one that worries me the worst. If I come to the top of a long staircase, let's say coming out of a museum, and there are no rails, I absolutely panic. I am not looking forward to stepping. I can do it, I'm coordinated, but I, I say, no, no, I don't think so. Let's find a rail somewhere. Let's find another way out. And it's amazing how many places you go that don't have railings. It only made me begin to appreciate it. And it's all in my head, but at the same time, being number one concern in my life, number one, number two, number three, number four, do not fall. Because that's where the damage comes in for most people. Such balance or association with tendency to lift or fall back or retropulsion. There is another disease where you fall forward. If PSP or one of those, you have a tendency to fall forward. In, in Parkinson's, you fall back. And again, a couple of times I fell, one time I was getting on a bus in New York and I just stepped off the curb wrong. But one time, just recently when I kind of stumbled around, again, it was one of these uh, standing up, lightheaded and sort of thing. So now I'm much more careful. Every time I stand up, I stand still for a minute or two before I take my first steps. non motor symptoms, cognitive changes there. I don't think I'm having any problem. I don't know why, but I, I've literally written probably 150 poems, many of which I send out to people and get pretty good results. And I have no idea where that came from. All of a sudden, it, it is kind of an obsession. That's why I read you that one trait in the other scale, because I sometimes will start at nine o'clock at night and I'll hear Phil say, come on, you gotta come to bed. And I'm still there at 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Half measures avail me nothing. And so actually they call it, uh, see that, there he goes. They call it 
hobbyism. The, cl the clinicians call it hobbyism, where you learn that you concentrate on one thing. It's kind of like an uh, autistic kid gets on dinosaurs. Well, I get on poems, and I my poems have to rhyme, they have to fit, and I'll just right. keep chasing words until I get it. Now, again, some of these things, in my mind, the fact I, I wish to give you a little poem I wrote, that I call the tip of the octogenarian's tongue is that when I'm trying to think of something, I can't. And his poor wife, suffering wife, I get mad at her because she can't remember the word either, even though it's not in context. What's that word? I can see that word. Well, that happens with most of the people around here. Certainly not all of them have Parkinson. That's normal aging. So again, I come back to the issue of depending on when you get Parkinson's, and how it affects your life depend has a lot to do with some of the symptoms. Depression and anxiety, fairly common. I've had that around. I've never had anything to do with hyposemia or ano, anosmia with loss of smell or odors. Fatigue, I don't really have that. IBS I've had. Disturbances of the system are common. A recent meta-analysis indicated there's a significant association between IBS and, and PD. And subjects with IBS have a higher risk of developing PD compared to those who don't. Lightheadedness is another one of the non-motor symptoms, at least 30 to 6%. It's called orthostatic hypertension. It's really it should start with the neurological orthostatic hypertension, hypotension, hypo, meaning, of course, low, not hyper. So I went from hypertension, blood pressure of 190 over 100 at times. I had white coat syndrome to the point where I wouldn't let anybody take my blood pressure. And now I'm going just the opposite way and I have hypotension. REM sleep disorder, which again I had, and these brain signals don't work properly. This is REM sleep behavior. People with or have active dreams in which they're playing sports, running, I remember playing hockey, or even being chased or attacked. I was being chased when I went off the side of the bed. I just had to get away, it was so real. And at the time, this was long before I had any kind of a diagnosis. I just assumed it was a bad night. But now, since I've been taking the clonazepam, I've not had any of that issue. I pretty well sleep through the night, right through. <clears throat> Aging in PD. One does not need to be elderly for PD to occur. We're going to find out there's something called young, young onset PD. Aging is not PD. 80 years and older, which includes me, the prevalence of PD is 1% to 2% of the population. So there's 1,800 of us here at Green Spring. Most of them 80 and older, not my wife, but a lot of them. Probably average age, I think, is 85. So 1% would be 1,880 of us. I don't know if that's the case. The shared biology. Aging creates a vulnerable pre-Parkinsonian state and the modeling and vetting of potential therapeutic interventions. The tip of the octogenarian's tongue. This is a poem I write, wrote, and I'm kind of proud of just to prove that, and it wasn't that long ago that I wrote this. Having long passed the prime of my life, I've developed a kind of linguistic strife. Words that used to venture out of to my tip's tip, tongue's tip, now find refuge somewhere under my lower lip. Words that popped out of my mouth without hesitation just seem to sit there not knowing their destination. The word is right there. It's just at the tip of my tongue. It's a phrase I really use until my memory loss is undone. The word is surreptitiously hiding just under my lip and will slowly migrate outward at an octogenarian's clip. I can picture the object. I'm trying desperately to name. But as in my new cognition, I choose the wrong memory lane. 
I look back with envy at my youthful, speedy linguistic recall when the proper word stood in an orderly line awaiting its call. And when cold left the tip of my tongue with nary a delay, to continue the conversation with many new things to say. It's painful to search for a word that you've said a thousand times, seeing it, practically feeling it, and knowing at least 12 rhymes. But eventually and unexpectedly, the word pops into your brain with a sacred promise that you will never forget it again. This aging thing is definitely a one-way street with no rest stop. But to continue on life journey, we cannot be communication flops. Fight for your thoughts and dry them up to the tongue to the very tip, and then use them with whatever communication skills you can still grip. And again, this has nothing to do with Parkinson's. Every one of my friends just about it anywhere near my age will have similar stories. We have the, uh, the whole thing of walking into a room and what the heck did I walk in here for? I never remember that. Anyway, so much for self-indulgence here. There's also something called early onset Parkinson's disease. And of course, the classic example of that is Michael J. Fox. And I can't cannot say enough about Michael J. Fox Incidentally, drooling is one of the other issues with Parkinson's. But I cannot say enough about his dedication to finding a cure, to getting people to smart about it. It's just unbelievable. But anyway, it's also called YOPD, which is youth onset Parkinson's disease. Between 21 and 50, Michael J. Fox was 29, I think, got his. Pretty much the same. But they, differ, they experience them differently because levodopa, which is what I'm going to talk about, levodopa is the, what you take to replace the dopamine. Levodopa affects young people even more dramatically than it does older people. And unfortunately, or crazily, or whatever, levodopa's symptoms of taking it is exactly the same. It's, ted, it's tremors, it's dyskinesia, and it all comes from the drug you're taking to stop doing what you're doing. So it's about 10% of those diagnosed are under 50, 90,000 new cases per year. Is it hereditary or genetic? That's the same old question, same old question. It may be genetic, but other external factors could. It's the same old cop out as far as I'm concerned. Pretty much the same one they use with cancer. Michael J. was just in 1991 when he was 29 years old, seven years before he told the public about it. Okay. His foundation, when you go, and I'm going to give you a whole list of resources at the end, any number of things you can learn, click on any one of these, and you're going to go great. So it's 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 just the Michael J. All you have to do is Google Mark, Michael J. Fox and you'll get plenty of things. About me and my Parkinson's. This is me in 1955. The only reason I put that in there, we went, we used, her mother, my wife's mother was in a place where they kept, where the older people kept pictures. I don't know why I'm doing all that. They kept pictures of, themselves on the wall when they were 21. Well, this is what I was like a lot of years ago. Now, I don't know how to get rid of this. Oh, there's the X, okay. My PD symptoms. I started with the tremor in my right thumb, literally. My wife was sitting there at the kitchen table and she says, what's with your thumb? I said, I don't know. Well, it just keeps going around in circle. So, Eventually drove us and now we're going to go down the time. Then I started having a tremor eating. Okay, when I'm picking up a spoon like this, I have trouble. I've learned better to hold it this way and do this, but I look more like a European eating than an American. Tremor in both hands when eating, okay? Reduced facial expression. I didn't notice it. Other people do. Fine motor cord, buttoning a shirt. 
drives me crazy sometimes. I keep at it. You know, if I, if I really give up, I then get that little tool. But for the most part, I try to do it without. I do have trouble turning over in bed. If I'm on my back, I'm on my back. It takes me about 20 minutes to get over onto my side. I have had several stumbling falls, dizziness and lightheadedness, getting up after rest, and REM sleep disorder. All these things now, I look back and, and there are other things I'm starting to find that perhaps were indicators at the time, long before any of the tremors. Present medications, I take the classic levodopa carbonate. Levodopa replaces the dopamine, but it also gets absorbed into the system very quickly. Carbidopa actually keeps that from happening. It slows down the absorption of the levodopa over a longer period of time. And the key to this whole thing is, and I'll get to it in a minute, Carbidopa prevents the breakdown. The key to the whole thing is there's off time. Okay, I take eight pills a day. Two pills when I wake up about 6.37, two pills at lunch, but an hour before lunch. Better to take the pills on an empty stomach so they get absorbed quickly. Then I take one an hour before the evening meal, and I take one right before I go to bed. Take two each time. And right before I go to bed, I also take the clonazepam so I don't jump out. So that's one way of doing it. There's a second way that some people push, and that is you can take pills that are capsules and time release. But the key is you're going to have walk periods. So when you first start on this down this trail, your doctor pretty much puts it all, not all, but puts the burden on you. You medicate yourself. And you do it by saying when you need it and when you don't need it and keep trying different versions. I started out with nine pills, but I started out with a half, half, a half a pill, then one pill, then one and a half pill. Then, you know, I kept increasing the dosage over a few weeks until I got up to, to nine pills. And at the time it helped a lot. It doesn't help as much anymore, but it still does. So timing your dosage is important and time release capsules is an answer for some, okay? Rosagiline, and I take it Rosagiline every morning, one pill, one milligram. It's used, it treats the symptoms. It works by increasing the level of certain natural subjects in the brain, nor, nor, norepinephrine, Serotonin, you know, serotonin is that feeling of satisfaction or goodness and the dopamine. So I take a resagiline every morning. It can help improve shakiness, stiffness, and so on. And every night before I go to bed, I take clonazepam because it prevents me from doing these crazy rapid eye stuff. Now, I went today to my doctor, and besides finding out I have to worry about my salt intake, she also suggesting that maybe I might have tried one other drug. And I haven't gotten there yet. I haven't used it. It's, let me, um, um, what's the name, babe? Yes. But um, she's holding off and seeing if perhaps, I mean, the whole issue is, is low blood pressure. I have low pressure, blood pressure for two reasons. Because I have Parkinson's. And because I'm taking three pills, a beta blocker and so on, Losartan, Carvedol, and another one, uh, Ameline Besolate, three pills to lower my blood pressure. So here I am all of a sudden at a crossroads where she wants me to increase my blood pressure by taking salt with my meals, which I've been fighting. So I'm first going to try reducing the blood pressure pill and see if that helps. And if that doesn't help, then I'll turn over to the drug that helps. So that's kind of the way you have to tease your way through this. You have to be a smart consumer. There's no doubt about that. You have to be able to 
So what I'm doing right now, I'm doing something called rock steady boxing. I'll explain that in a minute, but that's really good. Got a lot of good people who can't understand how that could possibly happen. First time I read about it or heard about it was Al, Al, uh, Alan Ola was doing it. He, he is no longer with us, but when he was, he was doing everything with rock steady boxing. He's still do with it. us. He's still with us. Oh, he is. Oh, good. <laughs> I do it an hour and a half a week with, ten, with nine other people. We actually have two classes going here at Green Spring. So there's 20 of us doing rock steady boxing. I got a shirt that says it. It's actually a franchise and, and a $100 franchise fee and lots of other things were paid here at Green Spring by a fund by a guy named Jim Davis and uh, his wellness fund. So we had two people from our training staff go and learn all the particulars of rock steady boxing. And they are taskmasters, believe me. It's great benefit. And what you do basically, the, the whole core of the thing is you jab this cola one across the two, left and right hook, left and right hook, depending whether you're left-handed or right-handed. And then they call out numbers like one, three, two, two. And you have to go one, three, two, two. And it's all coordination between your mind and your body. Everything we do, my, the person who works with me on a half hour basis once a week, she puts down little colored circles and I have to walk and at the same time say what color I'm on. So it's always a matter of, of coordination and mindness, if you will, sticking together. We're lucky to have a pretty good pool here that finally got itself underway. And I go swimming about 30, 30 40 minutes every day, unless I have COVID or RSV or whatever. I punch a bag daily. I lift weights three times a week. I do big daily, or at least that's my goal. And I'm active in the support group, which we find. I find the efforts in the support group. When I first got sober 45 years ago, I was very active in AA. That was a very sharing these, your experiences is just cuts them into pieces. It really does. And, and we've been pretty active in organizing and helping organize the support group here. Rock steady boxing, there's 60,000 people diagnosed with Parkinson's annually. Now out of a population 330 million, that is not a lot. There's 871 rock steady boxing and 43,500 have been affiliated and that includes me. Here's a study by the National Library of Madison, a true study, .gov. It's the kind of thing I look for when I'm looking into September of 2021, high satisfaction and improved quality of life with rock steady boxing results of a large scale survey. So you cannot tell anybody, they just, nobody can believe that boxing is going to help my Parkinson. But I, I'm, part of it, of course, is almost a placebo effect. If people all tell me it's going to help, it's going to help. But I do think it means a lot and I miss it when I, whatever reason I can't make it. So what, what's going on right now? Deep brain stimulation is one thing. My doctor told me there's another thing they have that has to do with ultrasound and they can do some things. So what they're trying to do is to shake up whatever it is in it that is not producing the dopamine. And deep, strain, deep brain stimulation has mixed results. We, we, we knew one friend who had it and it didn't seem to help her at all, but gene therapy, a lot of gene therapy, a lot of this stuff that they're doing with cancer, with CRISPR and all that kind of thing. That's a course. Neuroprotective therapies, exact saying exactly what it is protecting and keeping the symptoms from getting worse. Biomarkers, again, there is no stage for Parkinson's. There's phase four identified by some of the things you do, but there's no stage four like there is in most other diseases, certainly all the cancers are staged. So they're looking for biomarkers and perhaps neural transplantations. Oops. 
So I have a list at the end for anybody who's interested of all the resources that I used. First of all, this is our address, R-B-L-L-I. And if you get on there, you'll, you'll be able to, uh, maybe Debbie or... We can post the slides later. Yeah, we're going to post find all of these in the slides. I'm going to turn them into a PDF and then we're going to post them. The probably the best one again, without a doubt. Michael, Michael Fox, one word. Okay, Michael I. Fox, for whatever reason, dot org. Tremendous. I'm not going to click on them now. J Michael J. Fox. Michael J. What am I thinking? Yeah, that's a J. There's a, there's a, <laughs> anyway. Okay. Questions? Do you have any? Well, we have a couple of comments. Um, Wendy says, you said there are in stages, but then you described the stages. Phases. You wanna, well, you phases. now you had a chart with stages. So the, the stage well, scale that you describe with uh, behavioral symptoms? They're behavioral stages. They're, they're, they're symptom-oriented stages. They vary from person to person. My stage three may be your stage two. There's no, but, no the, but, you said there were no, but you said there were no stages, and then you described but them. But stage. Call it what you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. This book goes zero to four. One of you, normal, slight, mild, moderate, severe. Okay. That is not what stage four cancer means. That means mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. stasis. Well, I guess it's a terminology that's kind of, yeah. And Judy Robinson, what about brain surgery to relieve some symptoms of PD? What advancements have been made in this area? Are you familiar with them? No, well, other than deep brain. Yeah, well, that's what she's talking about. It, seems, it almost seems more like a chemical problem than a physical problem. Although they don't know, I can't guarantee that forever. The important thing is you have these transmitters and you have the receptors and they just start not communicating with each other. My simple little analogy again is like a Wi-Fi and I know packets are flying through the air and they're coming to my screen or coming to my computer and getting interpreted and then sending back. And that's exactly what the dopamine and, and, and the other, there's a dopamine agonist too, things that can fight it. The one I find most intriguing is drug-induced Parkinson. We actually, certain drugs seem to work counter to dopamine and actually take down your dopamine instead of increasing it. Okay, we have another question. Um, is restless leg syndrome associated with Parkinson's? I don't think so. I don't think so. That'd be more like essential tremors. Or it's neurologically based, but yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Again, are, ex mm -hmm. are exercises like cycling and running helpful and uh, helpful in slowing the disease? Yes, without a doubt. I think both psychologically and physically. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. Again, I don't want to emphasize this too many times, but I will. It has to do with aging. Also, most of the people that get Parkinson's are sixty or older. Davis Finney Foundation is excellent. Yes, we are aware of that. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, Chuck Webb, tremor is described as pill rolling rather than shaking. Good, that's good, yes, yes. Well, it looks like you're rolling, yeah. yeah. But you also have where your hands are actually literally yes, yes. shaking. I have both rest tremors and- Action, action tremors. tremors. Mm -hmm. Again, if I pick up something, go to drink it, that's why I have to keep it in the container like this. Uh, Linda says, neurotransmitters are necessary to transfer the electric impulses from one neuron to the other. Correct. Right. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Right. And yeah, and that's the it's, deficit. It's the key neurotransmitter probably. Along with nor, nor, nor pinna, uh, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. Does anybody else want to unmute themselves and make a comment or ask a question? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a comment. This is Arlen Gribben. Uh, Barry, um, you should be proud of the poem you wrote. It, it's just it's just beautiful. So I think you should uh, get it in the LLI newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll work on that. 
I have a poem right now in a magazine around here called Memories called Lines Lost in the Green Spring Pool. And it's based, based on a, a poem by Billy Collins called Lines Lost in the Woods. But basically I say, I'm swimming in the pool and I'm thinking these great lines, oh, this is fabulous. I get out and I go home and I sit down. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? <laughs> Back to the pool. Maybe next, next time I swim, I'll run into them. Anyway, I don't know where this comes And there's another, I didn't read the rest of the comment from Linda Hancock, who said there are neurotransmitters in all of the neurons of the entire body. Um, and all neurotransmitters in the entire brain, not just in the center of the brain. So right. thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, that. And there again, if you want to know about geological engineering, you want to know about plate tectonics, you want to know about, oh, I'm, I'm an expert. Biology was 1952. I remember dissecting a frog and that's about all I remember. Do you know about the special gloves described on 60 Minutes? <clears throat> yeah, that was pretty right. cool. Yeah. And there's a whole new thing with vibration. For some mm -hmm. reason, people riding on trains seem to find that their symptoms diminish. They're not exactly sure why, but there's a lot of studies going on. If you get into that Google Scholar and put in any one subject, just put in Parkinson's and vibration, you'll get a hundred, couple hundred thousand hits, it seems like. But, and they're all studies financed by somebody. They're pretty much the, the problem I have with Google Scholar, incidentally, is that it's so academic and sometimes you have to belong to the association to get anything but the abstract. But that's just the way it goes because it, again, it's primary references. Everybody looks at Wikipedia and then I'm, I'm, I'm happy with Wikipedia. It's got its limitations, but it's certainly secondary references at best. And nobody okay, Bar, Bar, we have a couple of, Linda, do you wanna make a comment? You have your hand up? Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to say I am a nurse and also my <laughs> mom had atypical Parkinson's. Well, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's, but then later on they they um, clarified or differentiated it and said that she had MSA, multiple system atrophy. But, you know, mm -hmm. you talked about toxins and you think that actually is very prominent in this disease because if you eat a lot of food processed food and my father wouldn't feed my mother healthy food and she went downhill really wow. quickly and there was a one neurologist whose parents both had parkinson's disease and he started looking into it and i just pulled up a study from nih and they talked about toxins and parkinson's and some of the synthetic uh chemicals that they <laughs> in processed food can affect your brain and you know there's lead and cadmium and you know there's just all kind of things so the chocolate toxins yep, yep. are definitely a real big problem from parkinson's but um you know uh it, it wasn't until she got diagnosed uh, her differentiated diagnosis came out that she had multiple system atrophy, which is not a very good disease because mm -hmm. she did not lose her mind and she lost, slowly lost all her bottle, uh, uh, ability to uh, control her bodily functions and mm -hmm. um, swallowing was the last one. And then of course, you know, she passed after that. So, um, you know, my father, if he would have fed her probably wholesome food, she probably wouldn't have went downhill as fast. But I mean, I understand why he did it, but toxins and food intake really makes a difference on your brain. Also, you know, you're right about that. There's many different neurotransmitters, but um, the cells, the neuron has a synapsis at the top. It 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 lets it um, releases the um, neurotransmitter and then the other nerve picks it up. And when there's that disconnect between, that's when you start having the different neurological symptoms. But when I started researching this, I started going down the path. I mean, I read synapse and I'd spend two days on synapse and I realized, my God, I'll never, I'm not getting another degree in biology teaching myself. So. Yeah, well, right. it's not really all that complicated if you find something that puts it more in simple terms. I mean, basically, you have uh, two neurons and one has a little capsule and the neurotransmitters go to the other one. And when they don't communicate, that's when you have the problems with the, the movement or whatever. So it's pretty simple. I mean, a lot of the, the sources that you get on Google Scholar are, you know, 
um, studies from NIH. And if you can go through the abstract, you can sort of figure right. out what it is. But it but is a lot of meta studies too, where yeah, they study studies, meta studies. Yeah, they put together studies 15 or 20 studies. studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, right. And, and, Anyways, and, that's my two thank cents. You. Thank hopefully, you. Thank hopefully, you. hopefully, it it's it helps explain yeah. it a little bit. Mm -hmm. How about Jim, babe? John, uh, John has his John. hand up. John. Yeah, I was just asking about the rock study boxing group. Yes. Um, who do I? I'd like to get involved with that or see what see if I can. Uh, we, we can send you Alex. Yeah, we have a we have a referral. I'd be we glad have, if you mm -hmm. come by here. We could w watch us do it. Okay. Unless, you, unless you're a Green Spring, and you have a diagnosis. Well, you do have the diagnosis. Uh, you've got to be a you Green Spring you, resident. You have to be a Green Spring resident. And second, you have to have diagnosis in doctors. Well, script. you've got to be living here though for that. Yeah. We, but we, I can show you what's going on, but we know somebody who does it. You'd have to pay for it. But anyway, what's your phone number, John? My phone number is 703-347-6171. Right. Right. Okay. And that's John right. White. We'll get back to you. Yeah, okay. that's great. Anybody? Uh, Bonnie. Bonnie Nelson. Yeah, I thought that, oops, was interesting about the cadmium because... I've been taking a reading Consumer Lab for years, and they list a lot of the chocolates that have cadmium in them. That's right. I, I tried to tell my friends things like Alter Eco and some of the Trader Joe's brands don't eat. And they said, well, if it wasn't good for you, they wouldn't sell it. And I'm no. like, oh my gosh. It was just an article about that in Consumer Reports. I know. Yeah. All yeah. the different, yeah, all the different yeah. brands and which ones and yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, because I belong to them too, but it seems to be mostly the South African ones. It, the Belgian chocolate, the uh, African seem to be better. Um, so I love, I adore Hugh, H-U and um, some other brands. But anyway, okay. thank, thank you for mentioning you. The chem and the toxics. Anthony has his hand up, Anthony. Anthony, are you there? Well, here's one. Okay. Somebody so else unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm Anthony Delucia. Yes, I've been doing rock steady boxing now for eight months, and I think it's helped quite a bit with Parkinson's. Great. My question was about off time. Do you experience that, and what can you say about it? Mm -hmm. yeah, depending on... All of a sudden, it's time to eat, and I go, oh, my God, I forgot to take my pills. Now I pay for it. If I don't have the discipline to take them an hour before I eat, I think that's why I, I thought about the time-release pills, the capsule, because they, they try to control, smooth it out and control the off time. They're more expensive, and they have a lot of side effects. I got the old-fashioned, I think I pay 14 cents for 900 pills but it's not a matter of money they work fine as long as i am disciplined well how do you pay for it how do you pay for it if you don't take the pill in the right time at the right time it just get shaky you get more shaky you know, when i have off time it's when i'm most noticeable a lot of times i forget a habit for sure most of the time in fact i'm not i don't dwell on it every day mm -hmm. lately it's been more because it's progressing but at the same time, I I have a feeling. Oh darn it! If you, you didn't, if you take them with protein, or if you take them with food, they're both competing to, to absorb right. it. Just right. Apparently, it dissolves pretty quickly, and it lasts about two or three hours at the best. So I mean, I take a. She's not suggesting I up it anymore. I don't want to take more pills because the pills themselves cause yeah. Dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, Debbie. Um, I just um wanted to thank everybody for coming before mm -hmm. more people leave, and um hope to see you um all at the February February first forum on four pause for ability. And I'm going to put a survey link in the chat box um in a minute. I kind of lost it somewhere along the way, so um.
or not. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get a poem out of this. Yeah, anyway, go go ahead. If anybody else has anything to say, well, I look for this for a second. No, I Over here, babe. We're okay. Just speak up. Anybody? Uh, yeah, hi, this is Ruth Nussbaum, and I wanna thank you, Barry, for this wonderful overview of Parkinson. It's been uh, very helpful for me to uh, learn about it because I have some friends that are developing it. Mm -hmm. And this has been a very good insight. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it's information you never need yourself. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> Not <on wood. laughs> Okay, um, my sister is right below you there. Yeah. My 16 year younger sister. So. Go ahead. Unmute. 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 Yes, Barry, I will be 70 this year. Think about oh that. Oh my God. <laughs> do you, you don't know of anybody in our family that had Parkinson's, do you? I do not. No, it's one of those things. Um, I was delighted to learn it doesn't seem to be hereditary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, siblings sometimes are more vulnerable than, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for attending well. today. Appreciate it. Appreciate the comments and the uh, the thanks, and just for being here. And um, wish you all well. Stay well. Stay well, and uh, be on the lookout for the slides that will be posted, and then the recording. And I will send that out to the folks who registered through uh, Lifetime Learning. And thanks for having Art on board. It was great to have you too. So I will send uh, Phil the survey link as well. My computer is not cooperating. So, okay. Well, I've had that problem myself. So, <laughs> and uh, Trudy should have it, but I'll send it also. Thank heavens for Dick Robinson. Yeah. Robinson. Okay. He's our okay. go to guy. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Debbie. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. And Trudy. And thank you, Barry. Thank you. you. John, Thank I'll give you, you a call. Bye -bye. I'll give you a call. Thank you.